All right, guys, here we are in Daniel, the second study. And in this, we're going to go through Daniel 1, 1 through 7. Let's read that. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of the time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Tananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Well, last week we looked at the introduction to Daniel, and this week we want to start moving through the book. And here we're going to see Jerusalem besieged and some of the residents taken captive back to Babylon. That's the ones we call the exiles. And so let's look at the defeat of Jerusalem. Daniel 1, 1 and 2 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So the time of defeat was during Jehoiakim's third reign in Judah. But God was very gracious before he judged Jehoiakim and Jerusalem. He always is, isn't he? He sent prophets, most notably Jeremiah, to warn the king of coming judgment if there was no repentance. But Jehoiakim hated what Jeremiah was saying to him, and he threw him into prison, treated him like a traitor. Now, people who love false prophets who guarantee God's continual blessing, you know, the health and wealth guys, those who proclaim peace, peace, when destruction is on the horizon. But listen to Jeremiah's words. These would be so appropriate for so many of the supposed prophets of our day. Jeremiah 23, 16 through 22, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they would have stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Amen. The church and YouTube is filled with these false prophets, telling the people what they want to hear so they will continue to give. But a true prophet will tell the people what God wants them to hear. They will warn them and plead with the people to turn from their sin. And this is what Jeremiah was doing, and the king hated it. But while Jeremiah was in prison, you know, God was still being gracious to Jehoiakim. He gave Jeremiah another warning, and Jeremiah sent that message to the king. But instead of repenting, you know what he did? He read the warning, then arrogantly cut it up and threw it into the fire. And that was the final straw. God was through with Jehoiakim. And we get these words from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 36, 30, and 31 says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He will have no one to sit on the throne of David. His body will be thrown out and exposed to the heat by day and the frost by night. I will punish him and his children and his attendants for their wickedness. I will bring on them and those living in Jerusalem and the people of Judah every disaster I pronounced against them because they have not listened. 
Now, Jehoiakim's disrespect of God's word and God's response, we can't pass that over lightly, can we? This should be a wake-up call to everyone called to proclaim God's word. His word is to be treated with reverence and is to be taught accurately. Isaiah 66, 2 says, These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Psalm 138, 2 says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Now listen to this, for you have magnified your word above all your name. So many pastors are now treating God's word with contempt, aren't they? They're afraid to teach the whole counsel of God because of what man will think of them. Or they twist his word so it always talks about giving them money. Then you have those who are in positions in our seminaries today, positions of authority who are afraid to teach that God's word is God's word, that it is inerrant without error. They teach it's just another book authored by man, and therefore it's filled with mistakes. So they are responsible for pumping men out of those seminaries to fill the pulpits of our churches. Men who disrespect the word just like they do. And so what you have is you have these men flowing out of the seminary into the pulpit, and then from the pulpit you have this disrespect, this contempt, this low view of God's word that flows into the pew, producing a new generation of full believers who don't trust God's word at all. All I can say to you pastors who treat God's word with contempt in the pulpit, and all I can say to you in authority in the seminaries who treat God's word with contempt and produce men who do the same, you need to repent. You're going to stand before an angry God one day, and you need to see that and you need to respond to it. So Jehoiakim has led Judah into sin, and after many warnings, God brings the hammer down. Let's see how that happened. And there's a bit of repeat from last week. Babylon and Egypt has been at war. Nebuchadnezzar defeats them in the Battle of Carchemish on the Euphrates River, and then pursues the Egyptian army back to Egypt and finishes off the conflict. Now, this was the beginning of the great Babylonian empire. Then on the way home, Nebuchadnezzar decides to stop by and take care of Judah because they were aligned with Egypt. So in 605 BC, Babylon besieged and defeated Jerusalem. It was the first of three sieges. And what we need to see here is, even though it was Nebuchadnezzar's idea to attack Judah, Daniel tells us who really defeated them. God was behind it all. Look at verse 2, Daniel 1 verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand. So this was almighty, sovereign God judging Judah. Nebuchadnezzar was just the instrument he used. God simply directed him to march against Judah on his way home. Now, there is an application here that I don't want to pass up. You know, it's so easy to deceive ourselves that God doesn't really mean what he says, especially when it comes to our sin. Oh, I know he said there's a wage for sin, but you know what? I'm going to be okay. So we toy around with sin. We convince ourselves judgment is never going to come to us. I think of those who heard the righteous preaching of Noah, warning them for years as he built the ark, warning them about a flood that was to come. And I can imagine the people there who were watching him were thinking, you know what? Yeah, yeah, crazy old man talking about rain. And you know, there he is building a boat. For what? We don't even know what rain is. Water falling from the sky? <laughs> really, Noah? fool. Then they watch as Noah and his family go into the ark. The door closes, and they feel that first drop hit them. What was that? And then the downpour begins. Judgment is falling just like God said it would. You toyed with sin, and you lost. Well, I believe that's Jerusalem at this point. They're enjoying their sin. They're partying. They're worshiping idols. Oh, yeah, we know what Jeremiah said. He's a bit of a fanatic, you know. You can't trust those guys. We'll be fine. Then suddenly they hear the news. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army has just turned towards us. They're marching towards us. And God brings the might of Babylon against them. The end has come with irretrievable force. And they were learning the spiritual principle Paul spoke of. Galatians 6, 7 
Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And I wonder how many suddenly recalled the words of Micah. Micah 4.10, Writhe in agony, daughter Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hand of your enemies. So here's the warning. You're going to Babylon. I am going to send you there and it's going to be painful. But there's also the mercy of God there. You won't be there forever. I will rescue you, but you are going to go. Now they would be there for 70 years before God would rescue them. So the prophet Jeremiah is warning those in Judah. The prophet Micah has added that the people were going to be taken to Babylon, but wouldn't be there forever. They would be rescued after 70 years. Then let's go to the prophet Habakkuk. I find this view, I find his view of all this fascinating. He struggled with the fact Judah was steeped in sin, but God didn't seem to be doing anything. God, why aren't you stopping this? Why do these people seem to be sinning without any consequence at all? Why are they still being blessed? It just doesn't make any sense. God, do something. Have you ever felt that way? As you look at the country you live in, these people are so steeped in sin and they're bragging about it, but they just seem to be getting more and more blessed. Listen to how God answers Habakkuk though. Habakkuk 1, 5 through 6, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. God says, Habakkuk, I'm about to do something about this sin in Judah, and what I'm going to do is going to amaze you. It's going to shock you. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians as my instrument of judgment to deal with the wickedness of Judah. Now, this threw Habakkuk for a theological loop. I mean, it didn't make any sense to him at all. Babylon, the Chaldeans, they're the same, were infamous for their wickedness. They were absolutely ruthless. So here's Habakkuk's thinking. God, why would you choose a nation more evil than Judah to judge Judah? Warren Wiersbe said something really interesting. He said, God would rather have his people living in shameful captivity in a pagan land than living like pagans in the holy land and disgracing his name. And let me say that again. That's really good. God would rather have his people living in a shameful captivity in a pagan land than living like pagans in the holy land and disgracing his name. And so Habakkuk was confused. And I, you know, I get that. I see the same confusion today in the Christian body. I did a video on why God chose Joe Biden using Romans 13. And you know what? Some people in the comment section they were incensed. Why would God choose a man like that who stands for so many wicked things? Okay, you know, I get it. Habakkuk felt the same way. But the truth is, when God wants to judge a nation, he doesn't always choose Christian poster boys. Why? Because he's judging that nation, not blessing it. So I'll let you decide if America is under judgment. And I'll give you a hint. It is. And I'll let you decide if Joe Biden was chosen to speed that judgment up. Scripture says God raises up princes and puts them down. So sometimes he raises them up to bless a nation, sometimes to judge it. And it's so easy for God to judge a nation, isn't it? Just put lousy leadership in place. Well, let's get back on track here. Where are we? We've seen God has brought Nebuchadnezzar against Jerusalem. They have toyed with sin and rebellion. Now they see when God warns it's not an idle threat. Jerusalem is defeated and Babylon is now in control. And part of the sting of that defeat would be that some of the precious objects are removed and relocated to Babylon. And we're going to see two things here. First, the vessels dedicated to God are taken from the temple of God and they're taken to Babylon. These were trophies of war taken to Babylon and put in the house of their pagan gods, probably Marduk, one of the gods of Babylon. Now, this was a way of saying, our God is stronger than your God. And think of this. At this moment, it looks like the pagan gods had triumphed over the true God, right? But not so. God is working out his purposes even in this. 
Babylon is the most powerful and important city on earth at this point. So if you can reach Babylon, you can influence the world. So God, in a brilliant missionary move, is infiltrating that city with his own people. He's moving Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his soldiers who will refuse to compromise into enemy territory. And we are going to watch how God uses them to impact the Babylonian empire, not just the city, but the whole empire. So again, God is not defeated here. This is a genius missionary move by God. And we'll see this as we go through the book. So they take devoted vessels to God from the temple, and they take at least four devoted young men who we already mentioned. And this is the exiles. Look at verse 3 and 4. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So Ashpenaz is given strict orders about who was to be brought back to Babylon. They must be good-looking, intelligent youth, early teens from the royal family and nobility. I don't think a lot of people realize that Daniel was from nobility. But why from nobility? Because they would be cultured enough to stand before the king in his palace. They also had to be intelligent because in an intense three-year training program, they had to learn the literature, the language, and the customs of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. So these young men would have to be the cream of the crop in looks and in brains. But to be useful to King Nebuchadnezzar, they must be changed into Babylonians, whose allegiance is with the king rather than with a foreign god. And Babylon used a number of mind control tactics to accomplish this. Now, I have four here, and we're going to end with these four. But the reason I want to show you this is so that you understand the relentless pressure that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were under to compromise. But still, they stood for God. So the first mind control tactic was isolation. Daniel 1.3, Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. The New Living Translation adds, who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Now, this would be a traumatic shock to their system, wouldn't it? Babylon understood when a person is isolated from everything they're familiar with, everything they know, their family, their home, their country, they become very vulnerable and more open to new ideas. So this would speed up their conversion to a Babylonian worldview. And you see the same dynamic happening today with our young men and women. They go off to secular college and are isolated from family, friends, city, and church. They're completely removed from their support system, and they become vulnerable to a different, a secular worldview. And many fall away at this point, even walking away from Christianity. Let me suggest a couple of thoughts to combat this. Parents, if you're funding the schooling, consider a Christian college or university. There are some really good ones out there. But I know that's not always a possibility. So I'm not saying never send your kid to a secular college. Sometimes you have to. But knowing the danger, parents and churches need to be more serious about equipping our young people for the storms they're going to face. So many churches are just entertaining our young people. And their philosophy is this, keep the kids happy so the parents will stay. But Xboxes, Playstations won't prepare those kids for what they're going to face in the world. They need to be grounded in the truth, don't they? They need to know why Christ is the only way and why the Bible is true. They need to understand why we believe God is the creator and why we can trust him. These young men and women are like lambs thrown out amongst the wolves, and they better step onto the battlefield with some spiritual armor to protect them. So parents, please find a church that takes equipping your kids seriously. And I get it. They might not like it as much. Your children might not like it as much. They like the Xboxes and the Playstations and all of those things that a church can offer. But if you find a church that is going to equip them, that takes that seriously, that's going to have huge dividends when they go away, isn't it? And so the first mind control tactic is isolation. Second is brainwashing. 
Daniel 1, 4. Youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. These bright, young, intelligent Hebrews were enrolled in a school, and for three intensive years, they were taught the Chaldean language, culture, and customs. Now, I'm sure the message of how good it was to serve the king was relentlessly hammered in. They were told over and over again how lucky they were to be picked to work in the palace. Uh, You do know how few get to do something like this, right? I mean, right? Work in the palace? Be with the king? What an opportunity. So they are isolated and vulnerable to new ideas, and this brainwashing begins immediately and occurs daily, and it's relentless. And so they're hearing again and again and again how great the king is, how gracious he is allowing them to do this, and how wonderful the Chaldean culture was. And as the world goes, it was the tops. I mean, the art, the wisdom, the architecture. It was stunning. So if you didn't guard your heart, it could sweep you off your feet. So slowly but surely, if you weren't careful, you would lose your grip on your Hebrew roots and the God you followed, as Babylon skillfully stole your affections. That brings us to the third mind control tactic, which is assimilation. Look at verse 5. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And so part of the brainwashing was offering the same food and wine the king partook of. I mean, this was the best of the best of the best. This was luxurious. This was extravagant. This wasn't Judah. This was the good life, the best of Babylon. Ever heard the saying, to eat like a king? They did. And Babylon knew if they could make the things of Babylon their treasure, they would capture their hearts. It's the way it always works, right? Jesus said this, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now listen to this. This is so important. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's radical, isn't it? What a warning. If Babylon became their treasure, their heart would follow. Their passion for the Hebrew God would be snuffed out. And now the application today, and there is one, and I don't want to pass over this. We must choose so carefully what our treasure is, right? I mean, let's make this so practical. In the Western world, we are constantly bombarded with the idea of materialism, or the idol, we could call it, of materialism. We see ad after ad telling us, We can't possibly be happy if we don't have what they're selling. And they are so skilled at creating a constant discontent in us, right? We're always needing something else. As soon as I get that one thing they told me, if I got it, I'd be happy, I discover I'm not. Because now here comes the next thing. They tell me, well, now you need this. And then there's the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And we're constantly chasing contentedness, and we never find it. Oh, we have to be so careful, brothers and sisters, about this. I mean, how many have walked with God through the years, and you know, they eventually become financially successful, and they buy that nice home, and that nice car or cars, maybe the boat and the motorcycle. And let me say this, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to be legalistic here and say you can't do that. But I am going to say this, there is a great danger there. Those things can become your treasure. And if you allow that, they're going to steal your affections for God. Your heart will always follow what your treasure is. So make sure you put God first in all things, including your finances. Make sure he is your primary treasure. This is so important. In 1 John, it ends with brothers be careful, watch out for idols. But all this is very clever, isn't it? These young people have been taken out of their homeland into Babylon, and they're very vulnerable now and open to new ideas. And so they fill their minds with this constant barrage of the Babylonian culture, which was extremely impressive. 
the Chaldean culture or the Babylonian culture could thrill a young man's imagination and make the home they come from seem second rate. Then fill their heads with all the privileges and status that came with a powerful position in the palace. Then on top of that, every meal is a sumptuous feast. I mean, look how good the king is to you. Look how good Babylon is. And slowly, Babylon and all it has to offer becomes their treasure and their hearts naturally follow. Eventually, they're Babylonian and not Hebrew. Well, let's look at the final uh, mind control tactic, which is confusion. The fourth mind control tactic. Daniel 1, 6 through 7. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. And so they changed their names. In ancient days, names meant so much. It spoke of who you were. I mean, today we've lost all that, right? My name is Bill. Bill. Yeah, great. But it even gets better. Bill Foot. Wow. But these four young men had names that identified them with the Hebrew God. Daniel meant God is my judge. Hananiah meant Jehovah is gracious. Mishael meant who is as God. Azariah meant the Lord is my help. These names would constantly remind them of the God they followed. So we've got to take that away. Let's give them names instead that remind them of serving the Babylonian gods, the gods that were providing such a good life for them. Daniel would be known as Belteshazzar, meaning whom Bel favors. Hananiah would be called Shadrach, which means illumined by the sun god. Mishael was changed to Meshach, meaning who is like Venus. And Azariah was changed to Abednego, which is servant of Nago, the Babylonian god. So not only were they being constantly taught Babylonian culture, every day, all day, they'd be called these names that link them to the Babylonian gods. I mean, it's just brilliant, really, this relentless assault on their Hebrew roots. And I'm sure it was effective for most. And it shows how amazing the refusal of these four young men to compromise was. I mean, these young men are so impressive, aren't they? Under this relentless barrage of brainwashing, but they stand for God. But as we saw in the first study, we must constantly remember that God is the hero in this book. He is the one who enables these young men to stand for him. And here's the thing. We've got to always remember we serve the same God and enjoy the same power so we can stand for him also. Well, that's enough for this time. And I want to thank you guys again for watching. You know, I love you guys. Hit those buttons. Help me out. And if you want to support the channel, help me that way. There are links down below in the description area. So I love you and I'll see you in the next video. God bless you.